All right, so I'm not sure what you wrote on the back. I think it says, close the clapper. All right, so here we go. Take 122. Perfect. <laughs> um, one of the first things that got done back in 97 was an inventory of all of the barrels. So we're meeting to discuss this with Ronnie and Leonard because they're in charge of the barrels and the barrel inventory. And there are barrels that have shown up in this count that are not on the inventory. So we say to Ronnie and Leonard, well, what are these barrels? And Ronnie says, well, there are experimental barrels. What experimental barrels? Ronnie says, well, we have a small experimental program what experimental program? Do tell more about this. He says, well, you know, we, we've got, we've been doing this for quite a while. Oh, lovely. I mean, do, do tell us more. And he said, well, you know, we're not convinced the way whiskey is being aged today is necessarily the way it should be aged in the future. So we've been experimenting with different wood finishes, different seasoning of the staves, because if you go back to the conversation about the barrels, you chop down trees, you turn them into staves, but the staves have to season outside. You just can't turn them immediately into barrels. They actually have to season for anywhere from 12 months, six months. That lets some of the undesirable chemicals escape, evaporate out of the wood. So if you go to a cooperage, and that we now have our own cooperage, you will see acres, pallets of staves, sitting outside, just ev letting the chemicals evaporate off. So Ronnie had been doing a bunch of experiments with this. This was captivating. And so my comment was, pardon? Let's get moving and let's, let's really explore all of this. One of the conversations was around warehousing. All the warehouses we use today, the industry uses, were designed and built in the 1800s. Right? That was when they first started building warehouses. So there was no science in the construction of these warehouses. There was nobody that said, oh, this is the ideal design of a warehouse. In fact, interestingly, if you read all of the research work from 1945 to the present day, it's how do we get rid of aging? It's a logical thought if you're a big publicly traded company about why on earth would you want to age whiskey? Why would you want to have all those barrels? If you could produce a bottle of bourbon in an hour, that tasted like one that had been aged for four years, why in your right mind would you age it for four years? In fact, for a long time in this country, you had to pay the excise tax when the whiskey was two years of age or a year old. It wasn't until the Ferran bill passed that you could actually store the barrel for four years or longer and not pay the tax. Today, we can actually store the barrel virtually in perpetuity, not pay the excise tax. We don't pay the excise tax until it's shipped. So all of the work was on getting rid of aging. So no work was done on design of new warehouses that were state of the art. So I look at Harlan and say, okay, then we should build an experimental warehouse. Let's see if we can figure out what an experimental warehouse should look like. So we did. Now I have to say this very slowly because if you run the words together, it comes out wrong, but it's Warehouse X. Warehouse X we built, and it's a five chamber warehouse. The chamber in the middle allows you to do things at ambient temperature. We're very worried about that chamber because we're gonna look like idiots if in fact all you need to do is put barrels outdoors in a field and let them age and they make better whiskey than these warehouses. Because then all we would need is a thousand acre farm and gun turrets. 
right, <laughs> to stop anybody from, from stealing the barrels. And then we've got four chambers, and what it allows us to do is, at a macro level, we can do sunlight experiments. So just sunbathing the barrels make a difference. Temperature control. So does allowing us to vary the temperature make a difference? Airflow. So if you blow a hairdryer across the barrels, does that make a difference? And then finally, humidity. With the four chambers, we can do things like hold the temperature on two of the chambers at above ambient, and then the other two, we can literally just level set the temperatures in different places. So it's gonna take us 20 years and we're about five years in now to actually go through all of the variables. Now, we have discovered, we know now for a fact that sunlight does not have any impact. Pure sunlight with no temperature change does not make a, a difference to the whiskey. We are learning that temperature does make a marked difference to the type of whiskey. Part of the genesis for this was the tornado that blew through here in 2006 and took off half the side of our beautiful warehouse C from the 1880s. And we ended up having two or 300 barrels sit out and sunbathe for the entire summer of 2006. And it produced unbelievable whiskey, which we then rolled out as E.H. Taylor's Tornado Surviving whiskey. It was a little bit tongue-in-cheek to start with, but the juice got rave reviews and it's become an iconic collector's item. But it gave us a bit of a clue that, boy, something there, was it the sunbathing? That was what got us to the sunlight. Or was it, in fact, in fact, it was the temperature that was making the difference. And then we have the airflow and the humidity tests yet to con construct. But I think the premise of this entire experimental program, which is called Holy Grail. So Holy Grail is a bit tongue in cheek because it's either Monty Python, we have not got a catapult yet, but we might. Or it's like the, the real Holy Grail, which is what is it, where is it, people don't agree on what it is. And then if you find it, can you capture it? Can you keep it? So the idea is we don't believe that the world's greatest whisk, American whiskey has yet been made. We do not think. So we said, all right, let's go find the reviews by credible critics of the best 20 whiskeys on the market. So we did. We then dissected those reviews and we listed all of the attributes. So we know what the critical community thinks is a really great whiskey. We've then attached that to all the chemicals that will drive that. So we've gone through and we've listed out all 187 chemicals that can drive that difference in the liquid. So we know what we're looking for. The trick is now is how do you do it naturally? We could get in a lab and we could have a little bit of this and a little bit of this and you could fix it. But that's not how you go about making real whiskey. It's a naturally occurring process. And that's what Holy Grail is, is to make the whiskey naturally. Now, Harlan's got underway thousands of experiments. So his next comment to me is, well, I, this is disrupting the orderly operation of the distillery at a time when we're trying to make more whiskey. So I said, what's the fix? He said, well, we're gonna to have to build a micro distillery to, to cope with all of these experiments. So I say, like an idiot, but well, that's perfect. We'll be, build it where the visitors are, right? So the visitors can see all of this. The fire marshal thought putting a potentially explosive device right where all the tourists are was a spectacularly bad idea. So we're looking around the distillery and Harlan says, I tell you what we can do. Once upon a time, we used to make our own yeast here. Making yeast in a distillery is a very bad idea. It's a delicate process. It needs to be done by professionals. And if you screw it up, you're gonna get wild fermentation. 
What does wild fermentation look like? When you take a Coke bottle and you shake it and you take your thumb off it and it goes whoosh, that's what a wild fermentation looks like. And in a 92,000 gallon fermenter, that's not a very good idea. So we gave up making yeast and we idled the yeast making room. Turns out all of the yeast tubs were easily converted into cookers and fermenters. So the perfect place and where our micro still, E.H. Taylor's micro still is today, is in the old yeast room. It's a wonderful repurposing of, of an asset. So now our experimental program has Warehouse X, we have uh, the micro distillery, and now we have Warehouse P, which is a super secret warehouse that we're doing all kinds of aging experiments in, and it's working. We will, in the next year or so, launch a product out of Warehouse P that we think is the holy grail of whiskey. So we will find out what the critical community thinks of that, but we're extraordinarily optimistic. I will tell you the, the experimental program is a bit like Formula One racing, where you take the learning from that and you apply it to your everyday operation. So not only is it given birth to new expressions to delight consumers, like four grain and old fashioned sour match, but it's also allowing us to improve, continue to improve the quality of our everyday whiskey. So it's been a fantastic, phenomenal program. But the capstone on the program was probably the, the Single Oak project. But I think um, the experimental program has taught us so much. It's also been very exciting to do, but today we've got over 3,500 experiments going on and all manner of barrels, and we're just gonna continue to keep pushing the envelope on what we can do. And quite frankly, I think now part of it is how do you continue to produce different tasting products naturally? So we know that French oak is making a big difference. We know that at a sister distillery, aging in port barrels makes a difference. Here at Buffalo Trace, we're focused on four corners of whiskey making, staying inside of that, and then trying to produce all kinds of different types of whiskies in order to excite and get our consumers to really enjoy. So that's the experimental program.